Hello everyone, um, I'm Athena Von Housen and I'm a planner with the City of White Rock. And tonight we're gonna to be considering uh, the public information meeting for seven properties along North Bluff Road, uh, which include 15704 to 15770 North Bluff Road. So I'm just gonna start with an overview and presentation of some of the zoning related uh, requirements as well as our official community plan. Uh, then we're gonna pass it over to the uh, applicant and show you a video. Um, and the architect will uh, go into the drawings and explain. And then um, we're also going to have the landscape architect uh, explain uh, some things about the landscape uh, plan as well. So I'm just going to pull up my presentation. So tonight we're considering the seven properties along North Bluff Road, 15704 to 15770. So in terms of the purpose of this meeting, uh, then the purpose is to inform you of the intent and details of the proposal, to clarify the scope of the proposal and areas relief sought by the applicant and receive feedback and questions. The format is a live event and it's presented by Waterstock Properties, Urban Arts Architecture and ETA Landscape Architecture. The meeting will be recorded and will be posted on the city's webpage following the event. So if anyone misses the meeting or you'd like to share the video, people can watch it following the meeting. We will not be uh, publishing any questions until uh, the Q&A section of the event. So uh, following the presentation, you'll be able to uh, ask any questions you might have. Um, or provide any comments. If there's any comments that are disrespectful or repetitive, we will not be publishing those comments. And if you have any addition, an additional questions following the presentation, you can contact me by email at the email below. Um, I will also show this slide at the end of the presentation if you missed my email. In terms of the next steps for this proposal, uh, we will review the feedback and um, discuss any potential changes to the proposal with the applicant. The application will then proceed to the advisory design panel for review and following the advisory design panel, we will be preparing a zoning amendment bylaw for first and second reading and draft development permit and presenting this to the land use and planning committee. If the land use and planning committee supports the application and uh, and council gives the application first and second reading, we will then be scheduling a public hearing. Following the public hearing, uh, this will be your formal opportunity to speak to Council uh, and address uh, any of your concerns as well as your comments or support for the application. Following the outcome of the public hearing, we will be bringing the application back to Council for third reading of the bylaws. If Council decides to give the application third reading, we would uh, finalize the bylaws for fourth reading and uh, finalize the development permit to present uh, to council for a final decision. In terms of the project location, uh, the project is located uh, on Lee Street and North Bluff Road. And on the east, uh, it, it borders McCod Park. And then Kent Street is just east of, of McCod Park and the subject properties. In terms of the official community plan and policy context that governs, governs these sites, uh, the plan designates these properties as east side large lot infill. So the objective of this um, development permit area uh, is to enable a mix of residential forms and choices uh, east of Peace Arch Hospital that are compatible with adjacent mature neighborhood areas and supportive of transit along North Bluff Road. In terms of the OCP in this section, it outlines the potential for townhouses and low rise apartments with a density of up to 1.5 FAR in buildings of up to three stories. The OCP also has a housing section and that's section 11. And the goal of this section is to support a mix of housing choices that are appropriate and affordable for residents at various stages of their lives. The, the objective of this section of the OCP is to support rental housing and a range of non-market housing options and needs along the housing spectrum. Policy 11.2.1, new non-market and rental housing, 
offers supporting new affordable and rental housing, especially in transit accessible locations by supporting rezonings for affordable rental housing with a density of up to 2.5 FAR and a maximum of six stories in the areas identified by figure 11. So as you can see, figure 11 is there at the bottom of the screen and we've highlighted the, uh, the sites uh, in the red box. So um, these sites are within figure 11 identified by the official community plan. And that is why there's a proposal with uh, 2.5 FAR and six stories in front of you. In terms of um, our development permit area guidelines, um, this, these sites are within our multifamily development permit area guidelines. So these guidelines actually regulate the form and character of development and allow applications like this to be reviewed by staff and our advisory design panel in terms of materials and building form and massing. So um, just, just after our presentation, I will go back to this slide, but this slide lets you know how to provide questions and uh, questions and comments. So I'll pull this slide back up after the presentation's done and I'll go through how you can actually provide uh, your comments and your questions uh, following the presentation by the applicant. Hi, my name is Ingrid and I work with Waterstock Properties. We love the city by the sea. We are fully invested. That is, invested emotionally, morally, and financially in the White Rock 2045 vision. This evening, our architects will share with you a vision for the beautification of the gateway to White Rock. That is, North Bluff Road. A design for a safe, and healthy community bordering the medical district, serving the needs of current and future generations. We say that life is better by the sea. No doubt this is true. To keep it that way, we need to come together on a set of principles. Principles that enjoy majority community support. These principles and community will are expressed in the policies and plans of the city. Let's take a couple minutes to go over what we focused on. The expansion of Peace Arch Hospital. The question we asked is, what does this mean for a city by the sea? This expansion brings nearly 300 jobs. That in turn means more traffic from staff and patients. What will that mean for our streets though? Finlay, Russell, Maple, Lee, Kent. To manage, we need to improve mobility. Transit, car share, ride hailing are just some of the options. We can also promote a walk to work environment. Both improved transit and walk to work require us to create affordable housing options, right? That is affordable housing options for the future generations of White Rock and future workers. We need to make live space close to workspace, don't you think? TransLink have proposed a rapid bus terminus station at the Finlay and North Bluff intersection on the Surrey side. This proposal is, in part, based on productions of ridership, which is based on the intent expressed in both the White Rock Vision 2045 and the Semiyamu Town Center Plan. Decisions we make on one aspect affect the other. We ask you to keep this top of mind. The core principles of the Vision 2045 official community plan are the core foundation on which we have built our proposal. We focus on the following policy objectives. 
Beautifying North Bluff Road, improving housing affordability, responding to the ripple effect of Peace Arch Hospital expansion, and environmental stewardship. Let's review specific policies. Grow up and grow old. This is the start point, providing housing choices for diverse households. Our architects will share with you truly innovative plans that are built on this principle. The OCP will also promote greater transportation choices for everyone. On the north of 16th Avenue and 156th Street, we have been instrumental in attracting a rapid bus service. At the terminus station will be a major mobility hub featuring all electric car share and electric charging infrastructure. Personal vehicle ownership is declining. Therefore, to promote greater transportation choice, our architects will share with you an innovative shared use mobility hub for this community. We cannot emphasize enough our deeply held view that life is better by the sea. The air quality is one thing, but a view of the sea outside your window is truly mood uplifting. You will see how our designs make a multi-million dollar view possible at an incredibly affordable price. For our location, the priorities are the beautification of North Bluff and improving the walk to school route for children and in the regional context, following the White Rock strategy of focusing growth in the urban center and frequent transit development areas. Peace Arch Hospital is a major economic driver. The semi Amu Town Center plan envisions an expansion of the medical precinct into Surrey. The mobility hub mentioned earlier will be located here. This is also the rapid bus terminus. Our architects will show how our proposal implements these strategies. The project is located in an area defined in the OCP as East Side Large Lot. The objective as stated is to enable a mix of residential forms and choices in the area east of the Peace Arch Hospital. The form and scale are expressed in policy 8.7.2 but we know that the approved project on Finlay is a major departure from policy 8.7.2. And in many ways, it has become the current dominant context and landmark. It will dominate the skyline and dwarf everything in the vicinity. Objective 11.1 .1 sums up the Beachway proposal well. To expand housing choices for existing and future residents and increase diversity of housing types for a variety of household sizes incomes, tenures, needs, and preferences. You will be amazed to see how we have taken this to heart. The living places and spaces created are innovative in variety and floor space planning. Included in our plan is not just a variety of type, but also of tenure. About 30% of the units will be designated affordable rental. These homes will have housing agreements registered against title to preserve their status as below market rentals. This is being facilitated by policy 11.2.1C and G, specifically 2.5 FAR and six-story built form. Here's an example of the conversations taking place in White Rock. We as stakeholders have expressed our view in the most positive way possible. That is bringing investment to White Rock for realizing the dream of affordable housing. We now have support from the community to make the dream a reality. The term affordable housing covers a large spectrum. Our focus for both rental and ownership is the missing middle. That is people with a combined family income of between 80,000 and 160,000. If we adjust for fixed income retirees, we find that the median income in this area is 110,000, similar to the semi Yamu Town Center. This means homes between 500,000 and 800,000. The affordable rental rate is derived from the recommendations of the Affordable Housing Task Force in 2017. Due to inflation since, the rate will be adjusted using the Consumer Price Index as a guide. There is some debate in the community about how the rental should be managed. We acknowledge this and have a commitment with staff and council to arrive at the best outcome for the community. We have provided insight into the city's policy objectives that we are implementing. Our founding director, Mr. Gurm, will be on hand to answer your questions at the end of this presentation. 
I will now hand off to our amazing architect, Shelly Craig. I'm Shelly Craig. I'm a principal at Urban Arts Architecture. We're here to tell you a little bit about ourselves and to talk about this great new project that we've had the honor and the pleasure of working on together with Waterstock Properties. Our firm is really one that is defined by community building. You know, we, we started the practice 14 years ago. It's expanded since then to almost 20 persons. Um, with I have three other fabulous partners that work closely with me. And today I am here together with Megan, who is one of our very valued project architects. So Urban Arts Architecture really specializes in community building. We work on a variety of projects all across BC. We have a specialty with working with smaller community groups. Um, we also have worked with a lot of different Indigenous communities, creating housing, creating community spaces for all. And um, we've also worked with many educational institutional and within educational institutional environments. Um, UBC, University of the Fraser Valley, um, we worked with the Greater Victoria Library. Um, our, what, in all the work that we do, we really specialize in making spaces for people. So we came to work with Waterstock Properties um, almost two years ago. We worked with them on a number of different projects, both within the city of White Rock and within the city of Surrey. We really value working with Waterstock because they really seek to make a difference in people's lives. Um, when they first approached us, we sat down and we had many different meetings just to make sure that we really had a common goal and we really kind of saw that the work that we do, you know, makes a difference in people's lives. The sea air is just amazing and uh, this, is, this is the beach at which my children grew up. We've come here it's all through the summer, every weekend. We're deeply connected to this area. When we founded Waterstock, our team came together around the idea that we had to think better. And thinking better meant that when approaching a new site, we had to think about what it would be like to live there. From that emerged three pillars. Better lives come from better places and better spaces. Better lives mean that wellness has to be at the center of our purpose. Better places means that to deliver better lives, we have to facilitate building of a community. That means the social spaces that we create where people can interact. And then better spaces means that we have to design floor plans that meet people's needs for today and for the future.
so I'm now going to pass it on to Shelly Craig uh, from Urban Arts Architecture, and she's going to go through um, the, the architectural plans with everyone. Thanks very much, Athena, and we're very happy to be here tonight. And thanks to all the White Rock residents that have joined us. I know it's probably really hard, one of the last beautiful days of summer, to actually stay inside and listen to a Zoom presentation as opposed to being out on the beach. I'm just going to share the presentation with you. And Athena, please give me a, a flag if it's not coming up. Yep, yep, you're good, Shelley. Good. Okay. Uh, we just gave you a little bit of a taste of what the project is going to be like with the uh, fly through videos. And I'm just going to step back and walk you through the project in a little bit more detail. And then I'll also be joined by Daryl Tayak of ETA, who is our landscape architect that we've been working with closely on the project. So this project is really all about building community as Ingrid so so articulated so well in the introduction that it's about affordability and how can we make places for people to grow grow up and grow old within the city of White Rock. So looking at the location, Beachway 2 is in a unique, fabulous location. It's right on the edge, the south side of North Bluff Road, um, really defining the northeastern side of, of White Rock. It's um, right across the street is Earl Marriott High School. It borders McCod Park to the east and then a couple blocks down is the um, Peace Arch Hospital and Medical Precinct which we know is rapidly expanding. They've just built a new building a few blocks further to the north in Surrey. So looking at the immediate neighborhood, um, we can see here it is here between Lee Street on one side. Sorry, West Coast Express. I'm in I'm in Gastown. Wait a minute. And so what I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about how North Bluff Road is changing. That this is an area that has seen a lot of growth recently and we're going to start with the far end of, first of all, we're going to start with an overall context of understanding, you know, what is the immediate neighborhood. There's been a lot of talk lately, particularly in our COVID era, about creating a village within our communities, creating a place where one can live, work, play, and enjoy life within a 15 minute walking radius. This is a concept that was made popular by Jane Jacobs, um, very well known North American planner who actually lived in the city of Toronto back in the 1960s. And here we are sort of 50 years later and the mayor of Paris is talking about the same idea in this, in this COVID era. We all know that it's even more important to really have everything you need within an immediate environment. So within um, a five minute walk of the site, we have the hospital precinct. We have Earl Marriott right across this right across the street. We have the Kent Street Activity Center. And we also have the Peach Ar the Peace Arch School coming and moving out a little bit further. 15 minutes away is the shopping area along Johnson Street and 152nd. So what's really happening is that this area is becoming the gateway to the Samiamu Town Centre. So as you come off the freeway and sort of start to come up the hill, there's a number of different projects that are really starting to bring a lot, a, a lot more people, a lot more delight and a lot more energy to the community. So I'm going to just take a few minutes to walk you through some of those so that we can really understand how North Bluff Road is becoming the gateway to both the town centre and also to the medical precinct. So starting at just east of the school, there's a project called the Lofts that we're working on with Waterstock Properties as well. And this one has recently got unanimous approval from the city of Surrey. It's a four story stacked townhouse project. Then moving closer, Beachway 2, which we'll be talking about tonight. This is a view looking across McCod Park, um, basically from the, um, the Earl Marriott drop off area. And again, looking at Beachway 2 from across the street, on the on the Surrey side. Moving a little bit further, there's another project, the Loft Houses. This is at 16th and and um, Lee Street or 157th in Surrey on the north side. So on the other side of Earl Marriott High School. It's comprised of three buildings as well, two six stories and a stacked townhouse building. This one just had its public um, information meeting last night within this for the city of Surrey. 
And then finally, Beach Bay One that we've been working on with the um, with the city of White Rock as well. And that's between that's at North Bluff Road on the other side of the street between Lee and Maple. And just one more view, looking back down, looking further east along 16th Avenue, North Bluff Road. So what's happening in Surrey? What's the, what's you know what's sparking a lot of these changes? The city of Surrey has been undertaking over the past two years a look at expanding the Semiamu Town Centre. So from this area that's basically being centred on the Surrey side around 152nd and 16th, they're looking at expanding it all the way out to include the area around the, the medical precinct and extending all the way to um, the edge of Earl Marriott High School. And this area in blue here is um, part of the area that um, we've been working on as well and it's known as South End Village and also has been has been under consideration of the city of Surrey as the site of the new medical precinct hub. And so the city has been undertaking a lot of community, community engagements to really understand what are the opportunities there? What type of place is this going to be? And fundamentally, it's really been defined about walkability, creating a sense of place and really creating that community and very much policies that are in line with many of the policies of White Rock. Looking at creating a complete community, supporting livable region strategies, um, really enhancing the public realm, making sure that our streets, our plazas, our parks are a full part of the design, supporting future transit. Again, we, um, Ingrid talked a bit about the rapid, the rapid bus, ensuring a diversity of housing, both in housing type and housing ownership models, and all of that underlined by a commitment to environmental stewardship. So South End Village, when it's realized, will be a place to, it will be that 15 minute village, it'll be a five minute village from Beachway 2, a place to live, play, work, shop and grow over the course of one's life. So one of the key initiatives, and this really speaks to what's going to be happening on the other side of, of the border in, in, um, in White Rock is the bringing of the rapid bus to this area because that will really profoundly change um, the access to tra um, transportation. Also as part of this community, um, the, the, oops, sorry, the, um, the one with 157th Street here is going to be realigned to match up with Lee Street and control signals put in to make for safe and easy access across the street to Earl Marriott High School. Um, another part of the initiative is adding another park in the area. So this will be located at 16A and um, 156th Street. And all of this is really about providing affordable housing and starting to really anchor both sides of North Bluff Road, creating kind of a community that is really allows a variety of residents to grow up and grow old in place. So Beachway 2 creating communities for families with children and youth. And we so understand that this is really a missing demographic, that it's so hard to be able to afford to live in the lower mainland. And many, many um, young families are choosing to live elsewhere. You know, my, I've lost my, my daughter to Calgary and you know, I'd love her to be able to come back and to be able to live in the, afford to live in the lower mainland. So this project has really been designed to support the community plan goals, the city of White Rock's community plan goals, manage growth, add homes at the north side of the city along North Buff Ro Bluff Road and really create a, a buffer to some of the single family houses that are that are located further to the south. Use land effectively, put the density where it's needed near the near people where, that are working within the medical precinct, support the town center, you know, really increase kind of the economic viability of the semi Amu town center with more residents in the neighborhood provide a mix of housing owner uh, options, preserve natural areas with responsible development. By developing here and developing within town centers, then we can save our agrarian lands, we can save the areas of natural beauty for other uses and for enjoyment. Um, add people close to transit, encourage economic development by locating people close to work, and then ultimately really ensure and enhance the quality of life through affordability. So I'm going to talk about a couple of these um, key community goals in a few more details from White Rock 2045. Um, number one is housing diversity. This project will contain 147 homes um, in three different buildings. One in blue here at the corner of Lee and North Bluff Road will be the, afford will be the affordable rental housing building. And then the other two buildings will have affordable home ownership models. 
So they will be um, containing units for people to buy. So this has the potential of having and providing a new community for almost 270 people. That's a lot of young families returning to White Rock. Three buildings, a variety of home types. And very much all of them designed with front doors facing the street. All three buildings have ground related entries. So townhomes that face both the street and face the courtyard. So that there's really enhancing the ability to meet and greet and with eyes on the street, creating security as well. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the different unit types. There's ground oriented units for families. So really looking at um, a two story townhome with an open, very flexible living dining area on the lower level, two bedrooms upstairs. We have one and two bedroom flats, so there's a place for um, seniors who may be down, downsizing, downsizing and want to find a place to live that's close to their neighborhood. Again, so they're growing up, growing old in the same neighborhood. And there's also three bedroom flats for families um, that have more access to roof terraces um, and access to the views as well. And finally, there are also two story homes with roof, roof gardens on the top level. So really, again, taking the advantage of ensuring that there are room for people to grow in place. So we go all the way from one bedrooms through to three bedroom units, um, including or housing types for a diverse number of people. And really, the intention is to make it family friendly, not only through the unit design, but through how we look at sort of shared amenities. So. What we've done is we've located the three buildings close to the street and really pulled back from the, the existing neighborhood to the south and use this to create kind of a shared courtyard area that has gardens, play spaces, um, has terraces, balconies that overlook it. Um, the indoor amenity spaces here allow, um, allow it to open right up into the courtyard space as well. Um, and other Indoor amenities include sort of a lounge, a gym, a guest suite, um, lots of different ways to really complement people's lifestyles. 55% are two and three bedroom units with up to 17% being three bedrooms. So one of the things we're doing that we believe is really unique is that we're bringing everyone in together into sort of a shared entry in the two buildings here. And from there you go into 15770 or 15748 or you can move through into the courtyard beyond. And so fronting the courtyard is, are all the amenity spaces here. So as you come in on a daily basis, you can see your neighbors, you can see someone working out in the gym and just facilitates that, opp that opportunity for serendipity and connection. And also really encourages, you know, indoor outdoor um, connectivity with the ability to, for um, different events to spill outside. So here's sort of whole sort of barbecue terrace area here and the kids play area is just over in this corner here, which Daryl will talk to you a little bit more about later. So really building community is all about, you know, eyes on the street and creating the heart. So we really believe with two main goals, creating, you know, all of those grade based units, both on the street itself, also within the courtyard and also overlooking the Cod Park, that we're making the street safer and we're making the park safer. So not only do we have entries facing onto the park, but we also have lots of eyes on the park from up above. Again, sort of making the park into a place that can be enjoyed um, into later into the evening with just the safety by knowing that there's people close by and there's always people moving through. We've also looked at um, really looking at sort of the possibility for pedestrian connections that can take people um, both along 16th Avenue, but also support people coming on this other sort of more winding route, you know, down through the Muse, Muse Lane here through the gardens, the courtyard, and then out to the park itself. Again, really starting to look at bringing, you know, bringing the public through and creating another safe alternate route. We also, this is also connected with um, different routes through between the buildings here and this area here, which had the combined entry. So this, this porous approach really allows um, our community to have different ways of moving through it and really kind of breaks down the scale and allows sort of more connectivity. It also also allows us one of the things that looking at a six story um, project height does it both it both maintains sort of connection to grade and a lot of research has shown that up to six stories really allows people still to feel that 
that connection with the grade itself, but it also gives us a lot of open space, that 40% open space that we can return to the public realm. Um, Ingrid talked a little bit earlier about supporting mobility, and we're really taking a look at what are the different forms of mobility and how can the project support walking, biking, transit, as well as personal vehicle traffic. So from a walking perspective, great for exercise, 15 minutes to the town centre, um, bike, we're facilitating, facilitating creating the new bike path along 16th Avenue. Transit is on the existing trans transit route and a five minute walk to the future rapid bus. Um, within the project, we've also included weather protected and secure biking throughout. Um, and now I just want to talk a little bit about parking. Um, we've done a lot of research into, you know, what, what are kind of the average size of parking spaces, what's happening, happening to parking, um, parking spaces within um, larger residential buildings. Um, and we've been through, been to many projects where the parking garages are half full only. And from a sustainability perspective, that's, we're both you know, excavating and getting rid of fill, that's not necessary. We're building lower concrete areas that aren't necessary. And we're also, you know, facilitating more cars on the road. So parking requirements cur currently for the um, city of White Rock would require 197 and a half spaces. What we're proposing is a very unique model. We're proposing 38 or 138, excuse me, um, parking spaces, but we're also providing a, a mobility hub within, within the project that includes 17 car share spaces and 26 extra bike spaces. So if we really think about those 17 car share spaces as contributing, say, only six spaces each, even to the um, to um, the overall car count, that would give us a total of 206 spaces, which meets more than meets the parking requirements of the city of White Rock. And what does that do? 68 less cars, 313 metric tons of CO2 will be removed from the lower mainland, helping make cleaner air for us all in the seaside community. Um, and this really impacted how we took a look at the parking. One of our major goals was really environmental stewardship and it was about preserving all of the mature trees all along the boundaries of the property. So what I've shown here is existing trees both on our property and on the neighbors properties that we purposefully set and limited the parking and set back the retaining walls of the parking lot in order to preserve these really significant beautiful clumps of trees. And that's another thing that led us to looking at the car share scenario and looking at creating a mobility hub. So talking about um, environmental stewardship, environmental stewardship really starts with smart growth. And smart growth is building well, supporting town centers, adding density and adding housing for the missing middle and areas that are easily accessible by transit. And that really checks all the boxes of this location. Um, it's then supported by creating social sustainability. How can we really you know, complete, um, create communities for connectivity? And we all know in this time of COVID that you know, we're desperate for connection. I'm looking at it a way of really enhancing the value of our precious land and our resources and making the most of the outdoor spaces for people to join, meet, gather is so, so important to the social health and well-being of everybody. Um, and then throughout this, it's underlay, uh, underlaid with just, uh, you know, respect for the existing vent vent, um, vegetation, en enriching the tree canopy, enhancing storm water retention, using all the water off the roof and using that within the irrigation. So we really have a project that's committed both from a building performance standpoint, as well as from, uh, you know, working closely with the land to create a place that is that demonstrates environmental stewardship. And fundamentally making space for kids to get out and really feel the grass under their, under their feet to, you know, have, be able to run and play, you know, have, you know, gather in this fabulous area with all these um, skipping stones or stepping stones to play games, both learning in kind of a natural play experience, having places to gather, tell stories, and also a place to kind of, you know, run and let off steam and be in a safe, secure neighborhood. And then one of the other significant policies we're looking at is really a build local strategy. You know, how can we look at 
getting as many of the materials for the building as close to the site as possible. We've done a lot of research into what we like to call 100 mile buildings and how can we build sustainably? And in this case, it looks at you know working with wood and are there opportunities here to create you know, a mass timber building to you know really use our most you know one of our most prolific and valued natural resources within BC and really basically complementing that with a very sort of streamlined high performance building envelope so we ensure that there's energy security as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Daryl and he'll be able to walk you through some of the landscape ideas in the project. How's that? Thumbs up. OK, great. Um, thank you, Shelley. Uh, my name is Daryl Tyke. I'm with ETA Landscape Architecture and I'll quickly walk you through the, the project. Um, many of the items have been already touched on by uh, Shelley or uh, or others, but I'll just go into a little bit more, uh, more detail. I'll start along 16th um, with the revision to the, the public realm. We're uh, proposing quite a number of street trees, a um, sort of wide boulevard, bike path, pedestrian path, and then um, a little bit more intimate uh, relationship between the, the terraces and the, the sidewalk, but um, providing a lot of um, buffer planting in there that I think will give a, a really quite a nice presence to the, the front entries. All of the units have a, uh, a nice little front porch um, big enough to support barbecues and maybe a, a table and a couple of chairs, letting you keep in touch with your um, your neighbors, say hello, eyes on the street and um, indeed life on the street. Um, as you come into the site, Shelley pointed out the, the, the numerous um, access points in through that, that um, sort of permeability diagram that she had. And the, so coming in from 16th, there's all these um, entry points, but there's also um, an east-west connector that runs from Lee all the way down to the park. <coughs> that pathway is intended to be accessible. Uh, there's, there's ramps where we have to make uh, any kind of um, sudden grade change or stairs. And as you go through that, um, down the length of that pathway, you're engaging in the, the public or semi-public um, realm of the, of the project through the, um, the urban agriculture area, the children's play, um, all the way down through the, uh, the various amenity um, rooms outside of the, the, the indoor spaces, and then down through the, the existing trees where there's a, there'll be a little grove of um, the, the existing trees with some native underplanting and stepping stones so we're not actually impacting the, the root zones. Where we need walkways, there'll be elevated um, boardwalk type um, structures so that again, we're not impacting the, the root zones. Uh, some of these trees are shared with neighbors and um, I think it's a really good idea to, to maintain these. They provide a bit of screening and Habitat, and as Shelley mentioned, being off slab, we have these these areas for um, enhanced stormwater management uh, with natural infiltration. Uh, the the front along um, the the park, I think, will be quite an exciting area with um, again a boardwalk, and um, so we we do have a, a couple of existing trees along there that we again don't want to impact, but providing a lot of uh, Eyes on the eyes on the street, if you will, and uh, providing a bit of a sense of security and um, just uh, again more life on the street. The um, uh, I guess the uh, the existing um, trees actually aid in the, the creation of the the children's play zone, which will um, be incorporated in there again with native planting and. We, we see these as being natural play spaces with uh, a lot of um, enhanced native planting uh, anywhere we can. No, thank you. Anywhere we can add in any kind of educational opportunity, we will. And then across the, the walkway from that are the, the urban egg um, 
plots. Uh, again, uh, part of an educational experience for the children being um, um, adjacent the way they are. Throughout the site, there are numerous um, nodes for um, public engagement, uh, socializing, and uh, overall community building. I think that's that's pretty much it for the for the landscape. I think it's um, I think it's got a lot of wonderful opportunities here, and I can't wait to see them realized. Thank you. So thanks, Daryl. Um, Athena and yep. White Rock residents, that wraps up our presentation. So I believe we'll hand it back to Athena for um, any questions. Great. Thank you, Shelley and Daryl. Um, so now we're going to move into our question and comment uh, period of the uh, public information meeting. So I'm just going to kind of show you how you would actually uh, add a comment if you don't already know. So there's going to be a panel um, on your screen and you're going to click on the little uh, comment button that's highlighted on uh, on my screen here. And that's going to pull up a sidebar uh, that will let you uh, provide a comment or ask a question to us. Um, and then I will read the comments out and Shelly, Daryl or Regbeer will uh, will answer your comments uh, or myself, depending on what the comment is or question. Um, so I'm just going to start now because we have a few that we have um, already in here. So I'll just publish them as I go through them. Uh, some are comments, um, so I'll just read those out loud and then others are questions. So. Um, I will provide an answer or um, one of the team will provide an answer uh, for you this evening. Um, so the first uh, comment is, I think it's a good fit. The height is only uh, 69.55 feet and it's uh, medium density. Our second comment is White Rock desperately needs affordable long-term rental accommodations. The designated location seems perfect. Um, the next uh, comment uh, slash question is below market rentals are not the same as affordable housing. It is just used to get the extra three stories of height for all buildings. For Beachway One, they were going to turn the affordable units property over to BC Housing and they have a, and it's posed as a question. So I think they're they're asking if the affordable units would be turned over to BC Housing. So um, Regbeer, I think you can, or Shelley, you can speak to that um, in terms of how the, how the um, affordable units would actually be um, allocated and who would, who would be, who would be running those units. Yeah, I, I would take that. Um, there's never actually any intent to hand them over to BC Housing. Uh, the intent was to follow the official community plan. Uh, the official, uh, the, the role of BC Housing is simply that uh, BC Housing provides uh, uh, slightly lower interest rate loans for construction. So that's would have been the role of BC Housing. Uh, the definition of affordable housing in the official community plan is that um, uh, that the affordable housing should be run by a non-profit organization and uh, uh, so I, I think we were being forced into making some relationship with a non-profit organization uh, to run that part of the, the, the rental aspect so but from um, BC Housing are not the people that will run anything. BC Housing's function really is was twofold. One was to uh, provide finance for the project. Uh, two was to do sort of a master agreement with uh, the city of White Rock for the um, uh, affordable ownership part of it. And the affordable ownership meant that uh, uh, the units would be sold at 10% below market and that 10% would eventually come back into the uh, City of White Rock Affordable Housing Fund. So in reality, there was a huge uh, community benefit in terms of building a affordable housing fund and at the same time providing uh, housing for this income group between say 50,000 and 80,000 income uh, 
we work on the same formula as everybody else does, the CMH does, the CMHC does, which is that one third of your income uh, should be able to support your uh, shelter needs. And based on that, and a, a, a one bedroom unit at $1,400 means that uh, you, you need an income of between 52 and 58,000 to be able to support uh, that. So who's this person? This person might be a lab technician that works at BC at, at Peace Hospital. This person may be uh, somebody who works at a coffee shop on Johnson Street. Uh, so these these are homes for people that live and work in uh, this locality. So uh, the, the, the handing over to um, uh, BC Housing is a total red herring. It, it, it has no, no, no the relationship to the truth. Thank you, Ragnar. Um, the next comment is a bit too much density. Townhouses would be better like the ones you built in Surrey. I'll just um, keep moving on as it was a comment. Um, the next comment is a good mix of units. Um, the next is a comment as well. From experience, people living in two and three bedroom apartments need at least two parkade stalls each. So around 260 stalls are needed. That's also a comment. Um, another comment, when you cut down parking stalls, the parking the parking goes out onto the street in the form of permit parking. Basically, this project will be eligible for 584 residents only parking passes. This project will add huge street parking issues. Um, I, I don't know. I, I know that these comments are kind of all in in terms of parking and um, the potential issues of parking. So I don't know, Shelley and Ragbeer, if you want to kind of comment on those 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 comments and not questions, but um, I, I would give you well, the opportunity think, to talk about parking. They're, they're, like. they're definitely worth addressing. Um, yeah. Now, I, I think that it, that both of us, myself and Shelley, should should add something to it. And uh, uh, so we, we rely on information that is um, published. And Metro Vancouver did a study right across the Metro Vancouver region. And that Metro Vancouver region study uh, came back with a number of uh, 1.3. 1.3 parking spaces uh, per unit. And that meant that you had, uh, that did not take into account um, car share. Now, Shelley mentioned in her um, presentation that there are dozens of projects across uh, the lower mainland where a uh, huge amount of parking was provided and uh, now it, it's sitting and empty and developers looking at saying well how can we repurpose that space so times are changing uh, the when you make a livable neighborhood and, and I think that I will pass on to Shelley to talk about this aspect livable neighborhood where you know you can roll out of bed and Cross road to 157, go to South End Village, and you know buy a jug of water. Uh, you won't need the car. So, I, having said my bit, I will hand off to uh, uh, Shelley to talk about this uh, complete community aspect and how the complete community makes it much more walkable. And most of your local services are uh, at walk walk distance. So it's very interesting to think of something that we've all experienced recently in COVID and we we're many of us were homebound um, and discovered that we didn't use our car, you know, for, you know, weeks on, on end. We were working from home, you know, our kids were home. We were, you know, shopping locally or maybe we took the car to go shopping and that was about it. And, you know, for instance, just anecdotally, I found that I didn't fill out my car for, you know, over two months. And it really got me thinking about, you know, how this is really, this is really the model for the future. And, you know, and then I look at um, the next generation and I look at people with my office and any of, you know, any of my staff, they don't own cars. You know, they, they, they live in apartments. 
they rent cars on the weekend, they do Uber, they do car share programs, they don't own cars because to own a car can cost, you know, can cost, you know, ten to twenty thousand dollars per year. And that's for a Ford Escort. So this is this is really there's a changing a changing paradigm happening where people are really starting to choose alternate models. And so how can we start to really look to creating sustainable futures for our, for ourselves and for our children? And those futures do not include parking parking garages that will be underused. Um, again, anecdotally, um, you know, my parents had someone mentioned in a two bedroom apartment, three bedroom apartment, you need two spaces. Um, they had two spaces. They tried to sell one and they couldn't. No one wanted to buy it. Nobody. Thanks, Shelley. Um, this is related to the parking again, and someone's asking how many levels of underground parking there will be. Um, currently, we have one and a bit, one and a third. And again, that is driven by really setting back. You can see here how it's sort of set back to preserve you know, the, the tree growth. So the parking is back underneath, you know, where the building is. You know, we could we could have accommodated it in, you know, one story, but that would have knocked out all the mature trees. So it's one and a bit right now, one and about a third. Thanks, Shelley. Um, the next um, the next one is a comment. This looks great. As a local realtor, I'd love to see more affordable op options in White Rock. Um, next is a question. What will North Bluff Road look like in five years? Well, I mean, I guess that's kind of a loaded question and it really depends on if some of these projects in this area move forward or not, I think. Um, Hopefully a happening dynamic place and that people that you work at Peace Arch Hospital or essential workers can basically after a 12 hour shift be able to, you know, walk home in five minutes rather than having to get in the car and commute for 40 to 45 minutes. Yeah, but you know, it's worth adding uh, uh, just the uh, street aspect of it. Um, I think uh, you will find that uh, maybe just the beginning of this year, uh, City of Surrey uh, set aside a $52 million budget for um, improvement of uh, 16th Avenue. And uh, uh, some of that funds, they're, they're looking at applying for, for federal funds. But the intent of 16th Avenue is that it is going to become a, a four-lane highway uh, with a median in the middle uh, and it's going to go all the way from um, you know, 128 uh, Avenue out to um, Abbotsford. Uh, 16th Avenue in terms of studies done by City, City of Surrey is a major potential and federal sort of uh, resource. It connects to the border, it connects to out to Highway 1 through uh, across at uh, Abbotsford. Uh, it, it connects to uh, uh, Highway 99. So uh, six, the avenue, 16th Avenue is going to become more prominent. But what we do know is that both uh, uh, Surrey and White Rock are looking at, at widening and taking uh, right away so that widening can happen. Uh, we know that working with White Rock, uh, there is conversation about the uh, a bike path, there's conversation about multimodal uh, mobility. So uh, quite separate from the buildings, uh, the, the street is going to change. Uh, no. Again, I'm sorry I have to quote Surrey data, but Surrey did a report in 2009. There's a corporate report that I can share a link to that looked at traffic patterns. And uh, at that time, uh, they, were uh, they, they, they were saying that between uh, ever since the intersection uh, on Highway 99 has opened on 16th, uh, the traffic has just gone through the roof. It's like uh, 20,000 plus vehicles a day and expected to, to, to increase to something 30 to 40,000 uh, by 2031, I think this is what their study went out to. So 16th Avenue is going to change a lot. And if you have a driveway on 16th Avenue and you want to come in and out, it's going to become harder. And, and I, we know this uh, firsthand from people that uh, uh, owned these properties that they were already having difficulty 
uh, coming in and out of uh, uh, their, their driveways onto 16th Avenue. Uh, we know uh, on both sides, Surrey and White Rock. So 16th Avenue certainly is going to change a lot. Uh, there is going to be beautification, which comes from the, the boulevards and the median. Uh, and then more so there's going to be beautification by the, um, uh, the, the beautiful buildings that are going to frame it. Thank you, Ragbir. Um, this is a uh, next comment question. I appreciate the presentation and certainly you have envisioned living in this development. What about people living on connected streets? Um, as an example, Parker Street, who have lived here a long time and may not be excited about having six stories looking down onto their properties. Thanks very much and for bringing that up, Athena. I think it's a really important comment and it's really important to discuss. Um, and that is why when we were taking a look at the buildings, we set them back as close to 16th Avenue as we could in order to really maximize the space and the separation to the backyards on, on Parker. Um, we're also looking at kind of a layered sort of buffer zone where we have, um, and I think you saw it in some of the illustrations that there was a cedar fence to provide kind of the first line of separation. Then so you're welcome to share your screen again as oh, well. Oh, sorry, I thought, <laughs> oh. <laughs> sorry. I thought it was. Oh, sorry, I thought it was, okay. No, no, you can, yeah, you, you're not, but you can share, um, you can share okay. your screen yeah. again if, if you'd like to. Okay, can everyone see this? Uh, just one second. Yeah, you, you're good yeah. now. Um, so yes, so pulling the buildings back, um, creating um, a fence all along the park, uh, all along the property line, ensuring, as Daryl talked about, ensuring that we preserve major clumps of trees, the significant clump along this area here, and you can see all of these ones dashed here. These are all existing trees, ensuring that we keep all of those there, and then layering it. You can see layering it with a hedge here that grows along. And so really looking at, you know, filtering the view. So there'll be no view from the public realm down here. There'll be no view through from higher up in the building that you will be, ba you'll basically, the residents will be shielded by the mature um, vegetation. And then that will be augmented by additional trees added in this area here as well. Thanks, Shelley. Um, the next comment uh, question is, are you going to use government loans? So, Regbeer, I think you can speak maybe a little a bit to that, and I think you kind of already spoke about it um, b before too, in terms of BC housing. Yeah. Uh, um, for this project, there is no government loan in con discussion at this time. Yeah, only what only what would be happening with um, BC housing in terms of um, financing the project and is that correct? Well, we haven't actually made an application to BC Housing for this project. Uh, this project um, may get funded another route. Okay. There was a there, there was a particular reason to use uh, BC Housing for, for uh, Beach Air One because uh, we thought that the uh, uh, affordable house ownership program was actually something of great uh, community value and that we should bring it to the community. Uh, but here, of course, there is no uh, conversation of that. So the, 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 the value that uh, uh, BC Housing brings in slightly cheaper um, loan uh, is offset by three times the regulations. So something like Van City can work out to be a cheaper option. OK, great. Um, tell me about the electric car share program. That sounds exciting. What type of cars would be there? Uh, would there be and would this be provided to the community? Right, well, this is all electric car share and uh, we will maintain a mix of vehicles. Uh, most of the fleet will be based on Tesla Model 3 and there will be as mo uh, sort of small SUV types in electric become available at a, 
a pickup truck. Uh, a Ford F-150 is coming up with a, with a pickup truck next year. So I think that out of the 17 spaces, uh, um, there would be 15 uh, Tesla Model 3, and the others would be uh, perhaps one um, SUV type and one pickup truck. Uh, the the objective is that car for all occasions. You know, if if you're going out in a, in a family and you need the uh, the um, uh, SUV, it's there. Uh, if you happen to be sort of, you know, uh, go out and, and buy a new sofa from IKEA, you've got a pickup truck that you can use. So it's it's, it's that kind of uh, approach that we're taking. And as far as uh, uh, its use by the community is concerned, um, this will be a decision that the Ultimate Strata Corporation will make, whether they will allow uh, people uh, outside of the complex who have access to the, the uh, mobility hub or not. Great, thank you, Ray Pierre. Uh, the next question is, how will this development affect the market value of existing bordering properties? Well, it should enhance them, really, um, because um, uh, the, the demand for, for this area will, will liven up. Um, you know, just before today's meeting, I did actually a, a search for um, what's what's happening in the property market in uh, uh, White Rock. What we've seen is a gradual decline in prices. Uh, what we've seen is that uh, the new builds, new single family builds, some of them have been sitting for three years unsolved, whereas, uh, say, similar size house in Grandview Heights uh, sells in two months and, and there are cases where they have multiple offers. So what is it about this location that you have um, a new build home sitting uh, for three years and not selling? And partly it has to do with you know, not having space for, for families. It's not family oriented. The, uh, the, it's it's uh, uh, partly, uh, you know, there was one person I was talking to in this research that said that they moved out of uh, White Rock to go live in Grandview Heights because of the Aquatic Center. Where do people go for, the, for their services? Sorry. So by, by actually bringing uh, this kind of housing and bringing vibrancy back to the area, uh, I think this will become a far, far more attractive area for people to live in. And um, uh, I can only see uh, an, an uh, positive in prices for, for people people around. I think it's really important to think about how the this project actually make, creates a buffer or a separation from North Bluff Road. So it really will also have a huge impact on the acoustics of the neighborhood that it actually will act as kind of a bit of a, a sound buffer to and make it a quieter area, which I think will be really important as um, as as traffic increases if this becomes more of an arterial route. Um, it also just enhances kind of the livability through cranes for more porosity um, in the in the neighborhood. And I see nothing but positive moves. It you know creates community, it puts eyes on the street, it creates more of a you know, welcoming neighborhood with um, you know with new friends. Thanks Rick Beer and Shelley. So our next um, comment is nice looking project and needed in White Rock. We need more affordable housing. People cannot afford to buy into the new towers currently under construction and we are blocking no White Rock views with Surrey to the north. So I'll just keep going after that one. Um, my, work, my wife works at Peace Arch Hospital and there's very little new rental in the neighborhood, especially larger rental units where you can actually raise a kid. How would you qualify for the affordable housing component of this project? As you would for any other rental, which is simply um, um, a credit reference, as long as your credit is good and that uh, uh, you, you fall within this uh, income. So we, you know, we don't want uh, really people earning you know, 150,000 a year to come and rent these units. We do really want to keep these for the lower income people. So I, uh, if you are in that lower income uh, uh, bracket, 
uh, that's that would be the criteria. Thank you, Ragbear. Um, next comment is very excited about the car share program. Can you tell us more about the fleet and the charging infrastructure? Will it be accessible? Oh, I think we already um, kind of addressed a comment like this before. So I think that um, access to the, the car share, will it just be for residents of the buildings? Will it be open for the general community? Um, I guess also the charging infrastructure that's going to be provided. If you know any of that information, you might not at this point. Well, the charging infrastructure, uh, the Tesla Model 3s are the base Tesla Model 3, so they can only charge at uh, 7.2 kilowatt. Uh, so therefore, uh, those units will have level two charges, but the SUV and the uh, uh, F-150 can charge at, at, at higher rate. So therefore, uh, we will have the still a level two charger, but a fast level two charger, which can charge at uh, 25 kilowatt watt hours. So uh, that, 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 that said, that uh, uh, generally uh, other parking uh, stalls will also have the uh, like 10 percent of the parking stalls will be uh, roughed in for for level two charging so that overall um, lots of charging options and will the car share be available just to the residents of the building i'm assuming uh, yes we will we will, uh, car share generally will be part of a uh, the, the South End Village, uh, a major mobility hub there. So uh, the application, the, the mobile app that would run will be will be a common app. Uh, this particular location will be run as a uh, station based um, car share. That means that you uh, pick up your vehicle from here and you return your vehicle here. Now, whether um, the strata chooses to allow other people to have access to the mobility hub uh, is something that we will leave to the strata. But there will be no restriction from the uh, mobile app perspective. The mobile app recognizes as a pickup drop off location and uh, but your access will depend on, on permission from the strata. If the strata decides to open it up, then it will otherwise not. Great. Thanks, Ray Beer. Uh, next um, comment, uh, times are changing. This project will reduce emissions and create housing options and transportation options for young adults. A lot of my friends don't want cars or they can't afford cars and houses. Um, did you look at the option of building townhouses? If so, what was the reason you did not choose to include this in the project? Well, there are townhouses, right? So all, all the ground units are townhouses. Uh, what what we did do was to uh, study uh, the need and uh, what the, the official community plan is edging. There are potentially, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, four or five sites that have been identified for affordable housing. So therefore, uh, the affordable housing uh, land available in White Rock is so limited is such a scarce resource and what we thought you know sustainability means we use our resource efficiently so what we have put forward is an efficient reuse of resource um, after these like few places that have been identified i think uh, uh, athena you put up that page 11 figure 11 that's it there is no other space that's been identified in the official community plan as being able to support affordable housing. And, and I think it would have been a travesty if we didn't actually um, include affordable housing here. I think it's really important to look at, you know, rather than a townhouse, we're, we're calling them city homes and every, every single unit all along, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but yep. and, at the ground floor all along here. You see all the stairs there, two story units all along here, here, completely this level here. Um, these ones are pretty interesting. They actually have little mezzanines within them, so you have kind of that extra kind of um, flex space. 
Um, the same thing here. These are all two story townhomes all through here. The spaces that aren't two story townhomes are amenity spaces. This is your, your gym area in here, you know, lounge, pool, gathering space in that area there, guest suite here um, within this building, another amenity space in this zone here. So the ground floor is comprised of townhomes. Thanks, Rick, Beer and Shelley. Uh, next question. Um, oh, it's a comment. Car share is the way of the future. Um, I'll just keep moving. I love the idea of a 100 mile build utilizing local trades and materials. I've never heard of this before. It shows the type of planning that has gone into this project. Love the design and the fact that the main floor is wrapped with step up to level suites. Um, good presentation. Can you please explain why? Um, oh, it's the same townhouses were not included in the plan. Um, so someone saying, I agree, um, re the car use decrease. I didn't gas my car for a month. The proposed parking is more than enough, uh, in my opinion. Uh, next question. How will transit service the densification of this area? Hi, uh, Shelley, did you want to answer that? Or did you want me to take sure. it? Sure. No, absolutely. Um, so basically, as part of South End Village, the city of Surrey, that we've been talking to TransLink about bringing the rapid bus to the neighborhood. And the concept is the rapid bus, which is a frequent you know, bus service, will um, and express bus service will basically come as its destination as um, Peace Arch Hospital. It will then do a loop on the north side um, through two blocks in Surrey. So coming down, then coming down either 156A or 157th, turn around and then park, you know, basically have kind of an, another end of route or um, pickup location again on the north side in the Surrey. So dropping you know, by Peace Arch on the south side and then picking up in Surrey on the north side. And this is a two minute walk from from this pro um, from this project, you know, in the meantime, um, as part of our research, there are a number of existing bus routes. I think it's within um, a five minute walk of five different bus routes currently. So it's well served both now and will be extremely well served in the future by transit. Great, thanks, Shelley. Um, next question: How? Um, um, oh, how many wheelchair accessible units will there be in the rental units and in the um, the market units? I'm I'm going to I'm going to have to get back to you because I know we do and I don't have that figure on the top of my head, but I think definitely within the within the um, the 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 um, rental building um, that we definitely have um, a few units that are designed for accessibility and the same within the market. But I can confirm that Athena and we can Great. provide those. Really. So whoever asked that question, um, you can send me an email. Um, I'll pull up at the end of the presentation my email again. And if you just want to send me a quick email, I'll be able to get back to you with that information from um, from Shelly. Um, the next comment is these homes are older now and we need to regenerate the area. Um, next one for people my age. 39 with two kids. This project will allow us to live close to my mom who never uh, fails to remind us how rarely we see her. <laughs> for townhomes to single family anyway, we don't have time to worry about things like grass mowing and roof maintenance. What are the price ranges? Uh, Ingrid did touch upon that and uh, I, I have to just say a little bit of caution about COVID. Uh, the reason being that we are actually seeing a, a huge escalation in material prices. But if we were on pre-COVID, um, we'd be looking at uh, 500,000 to 800,000 range. Thanks, Ragbeer. The next question is, what is the estimated time period of construction and how will the noise and dust be mitigated? Right. Uh, Shelley, were you stepping up to that or? I can, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. So um, one of the things that we're really excited about, I'm just going to sort of step back a little bit um, and I want to I want to tie this to a 100 mile building. Um, 100 mile building 
is basically a term that um, Urban Arts has, we have coined and we completed our first one in Radium Hot Springs um, and it got a National Green Building Award. Um, and we worked, we worked really, really rigorously to really identify and source where all the materials for the building were provided. And this is something that we were really looking forward to bringing to the housing sector. Um, um, one of the options, one of the things that we're looking at here is um, a prefabricated mass timber approach. If we use that, it reduces the noise and the noise, dust and timeline on site quite significantly because a lot of the um, a lot of the so the slabs, the floor slabs, the roof slabs, the walls can be prefabricated off site and craned into position. Um, if one takes a look at limiting the parking, if if we if we provide 200 stalls, we're going to spend you know an extra two months on site because you have to go a whole extra level down. So that will take off two months um, instantly, which really contributes to affordability and it contributes to you know more quiet within the neighborhood. So um, my. It, my sort of take on this would be that it's probably an 18 month build, maybe 20 month build in total. And depending on the level of prefabrication and the extent of the parking, that can be shortened by a couple of months. Thanks, Shelley. Um, the last question that we have in the queue right now is after reading the OCP, this is literally um, in lockstep with what the city has asked for. Is the only hold up the parking or does the city not want to follow its own dictates? Um, so I, I guess I'll kind of address that question is that um, our official community plan does set out um, the future potential land use in an area, um, but it's ultimately up to council to make a decision on an application. Um, so city staff re review the application and they review it in terms of our official community plan and they uh, make professional recommendations based on the plan um, and and then council ultimately makes the decision. So this project has to go through the process um, and I kind of spoke a little bit about that earlier and maybe I'll just uh, go back and touch base on what I explained in terms of uh, what has to happen uh, with this project moving forward. Um, and maybe I'll just use this this moment to go through it again um, right now. So um, basically, let me just go back here. So basically what has to happen in terms of the procedure and process that this application has to go through is um, next we're going to be reviewing all of the comments from this public information meeting and any any other feedback that we get and then this application will have to proceed proceed to our advisory design panel. Um, following that we're going to be preparing a report um, and this is going to be going to the land use and planning committee and then to council for first and second readings and if council does uh, give the application first and second readings um, then we are going to be scheduling a public hearing and that public hearing is going to be an opportunity for uh, you to speak to council uh, in a more formal setting um, and following that public hearing, then council is going to make a decision on if they they will give the application third reading or not. And if they do give the application third reading, then it would move on, and and they would um, they would give the application fourth reading after we finalize the bylaws. Um, so basically, it's up to council to make the decision, and this application has to go through the same process that all other applications seeking to rezone properties would have to go through. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, the The next question we have is when you say eyes on the street, what does that mean and how was it used for the design? Daryl, do you want to talk about that? Can you repeat that? Um, so, so it's just about eyes on the street. So what does eyes on the street mean um, oh. and how was it used in the design? Uh, okay, eyes on the street. Um, I guess it, it 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 simply means there are people about. Really, um, pe the more people you have um, active in an area, you can see you have eyes on the street. It's it's really um, just surveillance of the area passively. Just people walking through a through a site give gives others um, the the reassurance that there's there's safety. The more people you have about the, the safer a space feels. Um, 
people never really feel secure walking through a, a vacant or nearly vacant um, area. So it, it's really just about having people around. And, and I think that um, eyes on the street is really kind of a term derived from SEPTED, which is crime prevention yeah. through environmental design. So it's designing your environment to have things like Daryl said, like surveillance um, and people kind of looking, looking in so mm -hmm. that um, bad types of behavior don't happen because people are watching. Yeah. Nothing on the on the site that we've designed anyway offers the opportunity for people to, to hide. Um, the the east-west uh, walkway that goes through the site would be totally in the open. There's nothing um, or nowhere that somebody could hide and, and jump out. There's no dead ends such that um, somebody might feel trapped. Uh, just, just keeping an eye out for um, potential hazards and trying to avoid them in the in the design process. Thanks, Daryl. Um, the next. Uh, comment question what sort of plans does the developer have for construction worker parking during during construction well that's um, um, something that uh, Shelly actually touched upon uh, firstly there is actually uh, a good amount of this building will be built off-site and assembled on site so the uh, uh, the pressure of, of uh, contractors parking will be dramatically reduced. Uh, we've seen seen example of this where um, a site that was framed on site uh, had something like 30 cars and another site done by Adira in North Vancouver, which was done with uh, mass timber, uh, had like six park uh, pickup trucks park so there's a huge difference in the number of people coming and going to the site uh, when the construction method is uh, off-site building so uh, other than that the specific um, uh, management issues uh, we really haven't given thought to uh, but of course that's the that, uh, uh, traffic management and parking is, is part of the permits process and uh, we'll address it uh, as 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 our uh, general contractor uh, is brought on board. Thank you, Greg Beer. Um, so we don't have any more questions that are in the queue right now. Um, and I'd just like to encourage if you do have more questions or comments, um, please uh, them to be by email. Um, I'll just put my email back on the screen here. So it's at the bottom. Um, we just obviously like to really thank everyone for participating in this process. Uh, we really value your feedback and it's very helpful at this stage to identify any things that you're really, really concerned about. Um, so if you have any further questions or comments, please send me an email um, and we'd just like to thank you again and thank you, uh, Shelly, Daryl and Reg Beer for joining us this evening. Have a great thank evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks thank very you. much. Thanks to all the citizens that came out tonight. We really appreciate your feedback and your interest. It's what makes communities work. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. all. Bye-bye.